Okay, uh, let's get started then. So I'd like to welcome you to this very special uh, SOAS Centre of Taiwan Studies uh, seminar. Uh, we welcome Professor Scott Simon, who's the uh, uh, Research Chair in Taiwan Studies at the University of Ottawa. Um, the two of us are, 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 are two of the very few people around in the world that actually have Taiwan uh, studies in their uh, kind of job title. So I think it's a real, um, I think it's really uh, kind of a, uh, and Scott's back for the second time, I think. And so the last time was back in uh, 2008 in our Culture and State uh, Conference. Um, on this occasion, uh, Scott's timing is a little bit uh, odd because uh, essentially Scott's presentation and paper is part of our social movements in Taiwan uh, conference program that we were running uh, last week. Uh, and some of you came to the, the public event, the round table on the Sunflower Movement. But because of Scott's very complicated um, uh, kind of travel schedule, he's just back from Bhutan, uh, he had to delay his uh, arrival in London. So this has meant that we've got an extra uh, Taiwan Studies uh, event this, uh, this week. Um, Scott is particularly famous for his work on uh, indigenous studies uh, in Taiwan. It's published very extensively. So when we were trying to put together this, um, uh, this conference on Taiwanese social movement since 2008, he was the first person we, we thought of. Um, and the project is particularly focusing on Taiwanese social movements after 2008 um, and the kind of almost rebirth of social movements. But one of the things that we, we found in, in the conference was how there's a lot of uh, variation. Sometimes 2008 isn't the key kind of uh, turning point. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's uh, uh, give uh, Scott a warm, well, warm SOAS uh, welcome. And hopefully we should have a lot of time also for, uh, for Q&A Q as well. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Bethany, for inviting me and so generously allowing to make my contribution to the conference well after the conference. I would have liked to have been here, but like you said, my schedule has been a little bit crazy this year uh, with conferences in Tokyo and Bhutan and Wisconsin and now here. So it's almost difficult to remember where I am at any given time. Thank you all for coming out. I think this is a and a really a good gathering about Taiwan Studies scholars here. Um, so I'm teaching at the University of Ottawa in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and, but I do manage to do field work in Taiwan. And uh, from 2004 to 2007, I had a long field work project where I did 18 months of work in Hualien and Nantou. Uh, when I began my project in 2000, when I submitted my proposal for, to the funding agency, they were called the Atayal Tribe. When I arrived there, they were called the Taroko Tribe. <laughs> and then by the time I finished my project, they were divided into the Taroko and Sejek Tribes. So that's uh, been a very big part of the project as well. Um, I do have a book about that, but I think it's a bit inaccessible to most of you. It's in French. Um, it's called Sejek Balai Lotoktoni Formal Zandan Tusezita, and it's about state and community relations. But if you wait a while, I do plan on having a book in English, so, so that's it's just, a, it's just a matter of time. Um, um, anyway, I want to uh, give a talk here about indigenous rights movements, which was, of course, written for the conference. And I hope that through this and through our discussion and QA, that we can actually try to make some, get some more information about Taiwan and its indigenous movements. And I'm intentionally using the plural there because it's definitely more than one movement. Um, but maybe we can even start working towards a better theory about social movements and then and move on to something new. So anyway, you're all a part of our discussion, so I thank you and hope we can have some good discussion. Can you hear me well in the back? Is it okay. Well, so since the very existence of indigeneity on Taiwan as a result of successful social movement mobilization since the 1980s, um, I think that the study of indigenous social movements is central to understanding 
the social context of indigenous peoples in the country. Uh, formerly known as uh, Mountain Compatriots, uh, Shanti Tongbao, the Austronesian inhabitants of Taiwan, who currently number some 2% of Taiwan's population, are now fully recognized as indigenous peoples, Yunzu Mintu, a status which has wide ranging implications in international and national law. Uh, Taiwan's indigenous social movements and processes that seem remarkably rapid to outside observers successfully lobbied to get indigenous rights included in the Republic of China Constitution in the 1994-1997 revisions to create a cabinet level of Council of Indigenous Peoples in 1996 and to pass the basic law on indigenous peoples in the legislative union. And it should be noted that this is a document which precedes by two years the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and contains many of the same basic principles. Uh, there are differences, but that's uh, not the topic of today's paper. Uh, Taiwan's indigenous social activists have been regular participants in the United Nations Indigenous Events making indigenous peoples an important place and arena for Taiwan to gain voice in the international arenas. In fact, some people say that it's the indigenous people only who are represented in the UN from Taiwan. The relative success of Taiwan's indigenous rights movement to bring about legal change, especially if compared to other countries where indigenous activists have lost their lives while pressing for political and legal reform, merits solid social scientific analysis. And Canada is one of those countries where activists have lost their lives while protesting at Ipawash. Um, some sympathetic accounts of the movement in Taiwan, I'm thinking about some of the early articles by, uh, for example, Fiorella Alio, um, depicted indigenous groups as autonomous political actors that are legitimately pursuing their own group interests in a new democratic context. So for her, for Fiorella, the rise of the indigenous rights movement is a natural outgrowth of democratization. And so democratization simply permitted a flowering of a movement, but it was just waiting to happen. Um, Michael Stanton, himself a missionary and pastor as well as an anthropology student, analyzed the movement as an outgrowth of liberation theology. Uh, like Alio, he drew attention to the role of the Presbyterian Church in the formation of indigenous NGOs, which in a church with a majority of indigenous members is an expression of indigenous autonomy. But there have been some dissenting views about the meaning of the indigenous social movements as well. Especially during the Tsensuebian presidency, Taiwanese and foreign observers alike often suspected that the state instrumentalized indigeneity to claim a distinct identity from China. In a groundbreaking article on the movement, Tsinghua University anthropologist Gu Kun Hui uh, shows how indigenous activists exploited political opportunities to assert their rights at a moment when Taiwan was actively seeking a non-Chinese identity. So with kind of a state-centered approach, she concluded her analysis was showing how the state, especially the DPP, manipulated indigenous themes to legitimize a new national identity, and most prominently by using indigenous performers at the 2000 inauguration ceremony of President Chen sui -Pi. German sinologist Mikhail Rudolf took an instrumentalization hypothesis even further, even asserting about the indigenous movement and their protests and so forth, that, quote, all these efforts, of course, had not only the aim to demarcate culturally, but also politically from China, unquote. So for such authors, indigeneity is a way of showing that Taiwan is not Chinese. Now the former approach, which we may call populist approaches, tend to view the indigenous social movements as grassroots demands that are intrinsically inherent and liberating. 
finally gaining better traction in a new political context. These approaches can be combined easily with a political economic tradition in anthropology, such as that of Arturo Escobar, who used development as a discourse that legitimizes external involvement in local communities, but which is frequently countered by an indigenous social movement. The latter approach, which we may call an instrumentalist approach, sees indigeneity as a political construction accelerated by Taiwan's demands for fuller international acceptance. So it's a new identity type of argument. This approach is more in line with the works of uh, Brass or Rada writing about the Maori. These people who viewed indigenous and other ethnic mobilizations as forms of elite competition for resources. These divergent approaches tend to reflect debates within the field of anthropology, between anthropologists more closely associated with the social movements, um, some of whom have even assisted in the formation of international NGOs, and the introduction of indigenous groups into the UN system. And I will admit that I have been rather closely attached to the social movement myself. Um, and also there are those who've taken a more distant stance, contributing more to social theory than to indigenous demands. Now, six years of a uh, pro-Chinese administration under Mai Zhou make it possible to evaluate these two approaches by formulating a hypothesis based on the instrumentalist approach. If indigeneity is merely a byproduct of Taiwanese nationalist yearnings, one would have expected a waning of indigenous discourse and a refusal of state organs to entertain indigenous demands, as Ma's government de-emphasizes Taiwanization and seeks to legitimize rapprochement with China. I think we can see in this photo that, yes, Ma does kind of incorporate indigeneity into his politics as well. Um, so I think that would have been a surprise for some of those authors who equated it with the DPP. Um, yet I'm going to show in this paper that events since 2008 have demonstrated that the indigenous rights movement has maintained its movement. This seems to indicate that indigenous people have interests that cannot be re reduced to issues of national identity party politics or elite competition for resources. Um, somehow, parad paradoxically, indigenous people overwhelmingly support the KMT, yet indigenous movements are involved in both blue and green political networks in Taiwan. And I think it's important as we think through the paper and think through indigeneity that we see an important difference in English between indigenous people and indigenous peoples with an S. And to realize that it's legitimate that we can look at both of them as anthropologists. So indigenous people would be individuals who have an indigenous identity. So there are 500,000 indigenous people in Taiwan. Whereas peoples would refer to these 14, now 16 groups um, that have a certain national identity as being indigenous nations. Um, it's been a big issue in the UN that the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has that S at the end of it. In fact, there were demonstrations in Geneva where indigenous activists were, had signs with just the letter S on them to remind the system that it's important that these indigenous nations and peoples have the same rights as other peoples, especially for self-determination. So, I think that many social movement leaders in Taiwan hope that they can make progress in indigenous rights in ways that transcend the blue and the green divide that they often perceive as being a conflict between Han Taiwanese political actors that actually has very little to do with indigenous peoples. Now, events of the past six years suggest that the indigenous movements are here to stay no matter what kind of discourse the government has about Taiwanization or China. Now part of this is because the movements have been institutionalized to a certain extent. And 
So they already exist as NGOs and as people who are active in that as their careers and lives and so forth. The movements are also nourished by relations with state institutions that are specific to indigenous peoples. Uh, many of them predate the Chen administration. I think that this often gets overlooked in studies of the indigenous social movement in Taiwan. That since the Japanese period, if not before, that there have been a separate legal frameworks for indigenous peoples that are different than that of the Han people in Taiwan. But since 19... 45, uh, some of the institutions that are important would be quotas for indigenous legislators and township authorities. Uh, there were quotas at the provincial level before. Legal provisions for indigenous peoples in the Constitution and elsewhere in law. Uh, the Council of Indigenous Peoples, which also had a predecessor in the provincial government. And of course, the property rights regimes of reserve land that have kept indigenous communities and identities largely intact. So there is thus a certain path dependency which maintains the existence of indigenous communities despite whatever changes may happen in the broader political context. So this paper reflects upon the diversity of the movements and their mobilization strategies, especially since my Joe was elected in 2008. So, I'm going to reflect a bit on the social movement. And my reflections are based, they emerge actually from some observations made in my research project from 2004 to 2007 uh, three, in three communities, which are up here in the Turugu area and Turoko National Park and up in the Sejek area in Nanto. I was looking at development and resistance to development projects. Um, basically, in those first few years after the Drugu received recognition as a tribe independent of the Atayal in 2004. Because the project began in Shilin Township in Hualien, the main conflicts under study were local struggles against the incursions of Asia's cement and the Taroko National Park on indigenous land. The research coincided with local demands to create a Taroko or Turugu indigenous autonomous region inspired by provisions in the 2005 Basic Law, but also by Chen Sabian's promises that state indigenous relations should be based on a new partnership or even quasi state to state relations. Turugu demands for self government in a traditional territory that encompassed three Hualien townships and Renai township of Nanto were countered by local resistance and by demands in Nanto for state recognition of the Sejek tribe. The Sejek, who liked the Turugu, claimed that their membership included speakers of Turugu, Tekedaya, and Dora dialects in Hualien and Nanto were recognized as an independent tribe in the waning weeks of the Chen administration in 2008. In fact, back then they were quite nervous that the Chen administration would not recognize them. Uh, the uh, executive unit, in fact, told them this should wait until my Joe comes into office. And they insisted that it be done right away, and so it was, and they were quite relieved they were afraid that they would not get recognition from my Joe. Uh, although just this year he recognized two tribes that split away from the Zhou tribe, so it's difficult to know. Anyway, that's up to 2008. Uh, since then, in the context of summer visits to Taiwan and an additional six months of field research in 2012 and 2013, I have remained in constant contact with Turugu and Sejik activists. In fact, every time I, I go to Taiwan, I, I go Every year at least once, I go and I visit, I make a round of the island, and I visit uh, people who actually actively dislike one another that are somewhat in competition, uh, some of them who are very much in favor of the Turugu and others for the Sejek in the same communities. Uh, in 2009, while working as a visiting scholar at the Graduate Institute of Austronesian Studies in Taitong, 
I was able to observe activities of the Hunters Smoke Action League, uh, the use of open space technology to organize protests, as well as rallies against a proposed nuclear waste storage site in a Paiwan village in Taitung. In 2012, I observed discussions around the formation of the Taiwan First Nations Party and attended their inaugural ceremony in Taipei. Um, in fact, I think you may recognize that the name of that title sounds very Canadian because they use the word First Nations just like Canada does. And um, they uh, actually consulted me about the name of their party. Uh, they wanted to call themselves the Assembly of First Nations Party of Taiwan because Canada has an Assembly of First Nations. And my advice was that that name is a bit confusing because it's not sure if it's an assembly or a party, but they're actually two very different political strategies. An assembly would uh, have all of the, the chiefs of different villages and electing together a all general chief, and then they would have an alternative government and then ask the government to negotiate with them, which is what Canada's done. Whereas a party would have them in competition for those six legislative positions in Taiwan. And so that would be more like the Maori party in, in New Zealand. So there was a choice that they had to make. And they assured me that they wanted to be a party and run for office. And so my suggestion was to take away the word assembly to remove the confusion. Uh, and that's precisely what the Ministry of the Interior insisted that they do as well, which is why they took it away. Um, but anyway, uh, due to increasing use of social media as well, um, I've been able to remain in touch with indigenous activists, and I've been able to continue observation of events even when I'm not physically present in Taiwan. So as the social movements in Taiwan have matured, I think that there are what I'll call four new unfoldings which merit our intention. And I prefer to think of them as unfoldings rather than as developments in order to avoid any impression of linear development. So we really don't know where these changes are going to go. Um, we, I want to try to avoid the impression of linear developments or linear thinking or teleological assumptions. Rather, like the unfolding of blossoms on a tree, I think that some of these changes will mature into fruit, whereas others will merely wither and fall off the branches. So these four unfoldings are an increased emphasis on livelihood issues, the rise of non-church actors, the broad use of new social media, and a radical rethinking of party politics. So this is more of the old social movements where we see here they're making their, uh, they're swearing allegiance to the Sejek nation. Uh, buried in, in Danto at the uh, memorial site of Mona Buddha. And actually referring to Saide Kepo, the, you know, the native the country of Sejek. So the first unfolding, I think, is a shift in emphasis from name rectification, zhengming, which was very important in the first waves of social movements to livelihood issues. The first generation of the indigenous movement was necessarily focused on a rather Confucian dynamic of name rectification, getting recognition as yuanzu min and then yuanzu yuanzu. So that's actually translating the whole S discourse into Chinese, rather than as Shanti Tong Bao, which says, you know, we're all Chinese together in some way. Arguably, the previously used name of mountain compatriots already entitled Taiwan's mountain groups to certain political and economic rights as can be seen in the fact that the ROC signed the International Labor Organization 101, uh, which was in 1957 the first international 
Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, they did that just after the uh, Chinese invasion of Tibet in order that they could prove that they're better to minorities in Taiwan than they are in China. But nonetheless, that was a recognition, as was the creation of 30 mountain townships, Santishan, by Chiang Kai-shek. So there were things going on in a much earlier time than we often imagine. There were also certain mechanisms in the provincial government for the governance of these communities. And most important was, of course, the land reserve system, which was something that the Japanese had set up, and then under the ROC, it was, the land was privatized, but still kept in indigenous hands. Now, most of these institutions, like ILO 107, had the intention of modernizing the targeted communities. The goal was assimilation. And the idea was to try to somehow assimilate the uh, mountain and plains peoples all into an imagined Chinese community and so forth. But it would take time within these special institutions. Now, what often gets ignored is that there was a shift in discourse. In the international law, it was from international people to international peoples. But in Chinese, in Taiwan, there was the whole issue about Yuan Zumin, and then some of the conservatives, such as uh, the Yuan, that the Academia Sinica wanted to call them Xian Zumin, saying that everybody came from somewhere else, so we can't say that they're our original inhabitants, but we can't say they're our first inhabitants. And then this all came into the language of constitutional revisions, and I think it's worth taking a good look at that. Thank you. The uh, 1994 constitutional amendments uh, endowed Yuan Zumin with specific social and political rights. Indigenous activists who lobbied hard for Yuan Zumin continued to lobby to change it to Yuan Zumin in 1997. And it's kind of interesting. I think probably most of the lawmakers who voted for that in 97 were unaware of what the implications would be. The activists who had come through the URM movement of the church were very much aware. But we can take a really brief look at this. It's to almost everybody here um, is from Taiwan. Just take a look at 1994 and 97. And we can see there's kind of a sea shift here in the discourse. So the first one is looking at the free area of the ROC. Um, the second one saying it's according to the will of the peoples here. And I think that the big difference that I want to show here is that it's a shift from Yuan Zhu Min to Yuan Zhu Min Zhu. And it says that they have uh, Yuan Zhu Min Zhu, it's the Di Wei, Ji Zhen Zhi Chan Yu. So this is saying that it's protecting, this is number 10 here in 1997, the political status and participation of indigenous peoples. And this is very different from the 1994 one. The 1994 one is basically talking about indigenous people then would have the right to vote and so forth and present themselves in elections. Whereas in the second one, and I really don't think that the uh, politicians understood what they were doing here, but they're giving the right to peoples, which would mean the Atayal people, and the Paiwan people, and the Bunun people, and the Sejek, and any other group that was able to give themselves a name and get recognized, would therefore have a certain position. And this would be in regard to education, and communications, and you know, uh, irrigation, health, and so forth. Uh, economics and land, social welfare. I think that the last sentence of both of these really shows that the legislators didn't understand what they were getting into because it says that the people of Jiman and Matsu would also have the same rights. So, but that Yen Tzu Min Tzu set the framework for what happened in 2005 when the basic law on the rights of indigenous people sets up very clearly that the rights are held by collective groups as recognized in that law. 
And so that would include all of the different nations that we know, but as well as new ones to be recognized. So this was a big change. The, ironically, maybe it was intentional or not, but if you ever look at the official English translations, it says Aborigines in both cases. So the English translation does not reflect the sea change that happened in the Chinese documents. So those are quite important. The attention to name rectification in the beginning was very important. It subsequently led to name rectification for specific local groups. As successful demands for state recognition led the number of state recognized groups to expand from nine, from the entire period from 1945 to 2000, to 14 by the end of the Tetra Yuan presidency and to 16 this year. Observers, including indigenous activists involved in these issues, have been quick to know that the timing of these changes has tended to be strategically planned to influence the results of local and legislative elections. These events are not isolated from international developments, as groups seek to gain traction or friction, in the words of Anand Singh, to better push their claims. The emergence of an international indigenous rights movement in the 1980s led some Taiwanese indigenous leaders to demand full legal recognition that they had the same inherent rights as indigenous peoples in the Americas and elsewhere. Born in the urban-rural movement, these demands included recognition of the term Yinzu Minzu in the Constitution, creation of the Council of Indigenous Peoples, and the recognition of such peoples as the Turubu and the Sijin. From a village level, however, the rather abstract and political nature of these changes, such as Yinzu Minzu, Yinzu Minzu, made, their, made them necessarily difficult for local people, or what Rudolf calls ordinary people, to understand. So often, ordinary villagers in Taiwan often perceive the creation of new organizations or these institutional changes, um, including ideas about self-government, to be simple ways in which their local leaders try to create new positions for themselves. On the subject of indigenous self-determination, Mikhail Rudolf has quoted one person describing proposals for the creation of autonomous districts, which has been very fiercely debated recently, as, quote, only a means to get aborigines locked up in a cage so that people could look at them like monkeys in a zoo, unquote. The problem was that these issues, as pressing as they may seem to urban-based activists and their local allies, seemed very remote from the livelihood issues of rural workers and farmers. Even in the communities where I have worked, and where name rectification was a major issue, very few people were actually interested in whether they were called Atayang, Durugu, or Sejek. They were much more interested in such things as what price they could earn for their peanut and corn crops, or how they could take legal action against uh, labor contractors who would hire them to work on construction projects and then disappear when it's time to give them paychecks. But now that the institutional framework for indigenous rights has been created, the movement has been making a shift towards more livelihood issues, issues such as control of forests and shores, uh, the danger posed by nuclear waste, and the right to hunt. And these may very well gain increased traction in local communities. So a second unfolding has been the rise of non-church actors. As noted by nearly all observers, the Presbyterian Church has played a central role in the creation of the indigenous rights movement. The first indigenous rights organization, the Alliance for Taiwanese Aborigines, was essentially a Presbyterian political alliance relying on Christian concepts of social justice and Marxist-influenced liberation theology. Beginning in the 1980s and relying largely on international alliances that included Dr. Ed File and his Mohawk wife, Donna Loft, from Canada, 
The church trained a generation of indigenous social activists in training camps known as the Urban Rural Mission, or URM for short. If any of you ever participated in URM by any chance? Being from Taiwan, no, it's a, basically a way of training social activists. During this training, promising social activists learned to focus on group identity, define visions for social change, identify the causes of social pain in their communities, as well as obstacles for change, and then create strategies for action. During the training, instructors proudly give examples of their direct action, as when they toppled the statue of Wu Feng, a mythical Qing dynasty official who supposedly sacrificed his own life to convince the Zhou people to stop headhunting from its pedestal in Jai. And they noted proudly that the statue was subsequently replaced with a memorial to the 228 incident. Graduates of URM have launched various social movements, including a drive to reclaim land from the Asia cement quarry and factory in Hualien, but also various main rectification movements, such as the Sejek. So URM graduates have been very active in the social movements. The main weakness of this form of political organization is that it has been so closely associated with the Presbyterian Church that it has alienated members of other churches, including the Roman Catholics and the True Jesus Church, who sometimes label these activists as being too political or too green and so forth. Uh, the training camps have also been held outside of local communities meaning that they are available only to those individuals who have time and resources to attend, they thus create the impression that any of the subsequent political demands are the strategies of certain elites to gain power. Even the organizers of the movement against Asia Cement, for example, were greeted with local skepticism and rumors that their protests were attempts to gain a seat on the township council, or rather mysteriously to extort financial gain from Asia Cement, as if companies ever paid people to organize protests against them. Although the Presbyterian Church was an important incubator of social movements, it is noteworthy that activism has moved beyond church networks. Although these groups are largely organized by well-educated urban-based activists, they have managed to create secular groups that attempt to transcend ethnic or tribal identification. So certain new groups would include the uh, indigenous youth front, the Taiwan Indigenous People Society, Taiwan which is related more to independence movements, uh, the Association of Taiwan Indigenous People Development, uh, the Taiwan Yunzu Min Shui Yuan, Su Jin Hui, the Indigenous People Action Coalition of Taiwan, Taiwan Yunzu Min Hu Luo Xing Dong Lian Ma, the Association for Taiwan's Indigenous People's Policy, uh, Taiwan Yunzu Min Zu Zheng Ce Xie Hui, and the Hunter Smoke Action League, which is uh, the translation they've chosen for Lam Yan Xing Dong Lian Ma. There's also the NGO uh, Millet Foundation, uh, which has strong involvement of uh, certain anthropologists in Taiwan, um, which funds research and advocacy. Most of these associations are still urban-based, with their meetings and public events being held mostly in Taipei. Uh, the members tend to be uh, educated indigenous people, uh, with some support from sympathetic non-indigenous academics. And at the universities, there also are many indigenous student associations. The Hunter Smoke Action League, and that's actually a photo of them here, is quite interesting because it's more rural based and it's active in communities up and down the East Coast. And they light these bonfires at their protests, which has become a kind of a trademark. That's why they're called the Hunter Smoke Action League. Um, and generally, they have an annual protest, which they do simultaneously around Taiwan on the 28th of February every year. Um, they have been a bit more successful than the earlier groups at reaching out to villagers, and not least because they have been able to offer legal aid 
to people involved in land disputes with non-indigenous peoples. They're actually getting very much involved in livelihood issues of ordinary people. Even so, the people are very active in, in the Hunter Smoke Action League say that the people in the village are mostly too busy with farming and with work and you know, raising children and getting old and taking care of parents and so forth, that they don't have that much time to pay attention to indigenous rights issues or get involved in social movement activities. Now, a third unfolding, and this has happened everywhere, and like the other two, has little to do with Flying Joe, is that there's been a dramatic blossoming in the use of new social media. All of the aforementioned groups have their own websites. And as you surely all know, almost everybody in Taiwan has a smartphone. Um, in fact, last summer when I was doing research, people observed to, noted to me that whereas I use a very antiquated <laughs> cell phone, all of the old people in the village have smartphones and all of the children have iPads. So it's become very common to use social media. And the social movements have been very successful in creating platforms for themselves on Facebook and YouTube to spread information about their ideals, but also information about protests and activities that are going to happen. So anybody who's interested in indigenous rights can be better informed than ever before about what's happening in Taiwan. Images and information about land disputes are easily available. Um, I think, however, this deserves further research on how people are actually using these different kinds of social media. Um, it's quite possible that most people are still not looking at social movement sites. Um, my own experience in sharing with my indigenous friends on Facebook is that they tend to push like in very large numbers if I have a picture of uh, a, a deer in my front yard or my dog. But when I share information about indigenous politics, they tend not to get that many likes. <laughs> I think research more needs, more research needs to be done on that. Um, in fact, the most, the one that I really saw on social media of indigenous people in Taiwan active at a demonstration had little to do with indigenous rights. It was they were opposing same-sex marriage and had that on their website. So I think it still needs to be researched what social media means. I wanted to show a clip from the Hunter Smoke Action League, so we'll take a break from this and just see what they've done. I think this is quite a good video here. It's on YouTube.
in Hualien last December, there was a road black blockade, and a lot of people that actually went to support them. Um, they tried to prevent the forestry division from removing trees from their traditional land. And then, just this month, they uh, blocked the roads to tourists, um, especially Chinese tourists, and so they've required them to park the buses down below and then they have to walk through the village rather than driving through. So they are able to blockade the roads and uh, get what they want. Uh, these are pictures I took myself. Um, this has to do with a, a village called Nantian Bulo, which uh, has been consulted about whether or not they would like to store nuclear waste there. And so we, we took this trip um, to the creek where they plan on storing it. In a, you can see the ocean behind us there, and then the communities on just the opposite side of the creek were not even consulted at all. And so there's concern about the threat there. Um, after what's happened in Fukushima, I think that we're all aware of the threat that nuclear power posed. And so here's the uh, demonstration they had in front of Tai, tai Power in Taitung. So that's been an issue. Hunting issues are really big issues. Uh, hunting has been somewhat decriminalized, um, but hunters would still have to apply a month in advance to the township authorities, um, and then they're only permitted to hunt where they said they would hunt, and the animal they said that they would catch. But of course it's impossible to know what kind of animal you meet in the forest, and when your ancestors will give you a dream telling you when to hunt and so forth. So people still do get arrested. So we see here uh, Carl Winchy uh, defending Aboriginal hunters at the Taroko National Park, and then the policemen giving their apologies for their actions towards hunters. So just some pictures there. Um, in conclusion, what does all this mean? Um, in my book here, Sejek Balai, I demonstrated that all of the political and social measures taken for and by the acephalous communities of societies of Taiwan, from township elections to name rectification, have contributed to a bureaucratization of indigeneity. The charismatic leadership of these formerly egalitarian societies has been routinized into forms of state leadership, albeit not without resistance from ordinary people's perspectives, like those of the international indigenous movement, are still infused with ideals of equality between men and spiritual notions of law. This calls for a radical rethinking of the meaning of the indigenous social movements in a way that explains its resilience in the face of wider political change. James Scott, in his book, The Art of Not Being Governed, was quite skeptical of indigenism, which he framed as yet another millenarian movement after centuries of Southeast Asian religious prophets based on Buddhism or Christianity. In his words, the destination remains the same, but the means of transportation has changed. All of these imagined communities have been charged with utopian expectations, unquote. So I think we need to think seriously about what that means, and think about indigeneity as being a cosmology as well. And I think we need to be serious about the idea that culture in anthropology also has certain teleological assumptions that cultures exist to perpetuate themselves. But I think what we need to do is think about not just the indigenous peoples that are involved, even though we've been learning that that's the way we should think, but also indigenous people. I think we can better understand various social movements and the resilience of indigenous peoples in the face of political change, if we think of them as composed of individual actors who continue to pursue their own livelihoods and strategies among changing circumstances. We can thus better perceive continuity in terms of the indigenous legislators, township authorities, and public servants who have maintained and thus even entrenched their positions in Taiwan as the KMT returns to the presidency and the executive yuan. We can also see the importance of livelihood issues as thousands of people outside of these privileged positions seek to maintain their own lifestyles based on farming, productive labor, fishing, and hunting. Taiwan's indigenous movements seem to gain best traction when they can relate 
to livelihood issues as those lifestyles are threatened by coastal development, nuclear waste storage, the criminalization of hunting, etc. To see the social movements as only elite competition misses most of the picture. Because these supposed elites, whether they are legislators, pastors, musicians, or unemployed youth with university degrees, are also members of their communities, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters of ordinary people. And these elites are not the only people involved in social movements, which rely on their success on thousands of students, workers, small entrepreneurs, farmers, and unemployed people who devote their time and resources. These people are very capable of judging others in their situation. They may be critical when they talk about the social movement to outside observers, but their intellects are just as keen when they decide to join a demonstration or to vote for a candidate. And yes, they do vote for the KMT, but I think they do so because they've intelligently thought through what that means. Uh, the actions and strategies of social movement entrepreneurs and their somewhat fickle supporters are neither those of isolated rational actors nor beings overdetermined by culture, but they are human beings embedded in social networks who are motivated not just by power and money, but also by emotion and faith. It is thus not surprising that the indigenous social movements continue to unfold in changing circumstances, but we need better tools to understand it. So I, I found this quite interesting from a, a photo from a conference that was held last year by none other than the Executive UN and Mind Jail, Self-Determination and Sustainable Development, a conference on national policies for indigenous peoples in the Century. And we can see that the state, just like the social movement, is talking about indigenous self-administration. They mean different things by it. But then they're talking more about more neoliberal things like boosting development of indigenous industries and promoting ethnocultural pluralism. What's interesting is looking through the faces in here, we can see that many of them are the same people who show up at demonstrations, who even lead demonstrations, who are uh, indigenous uh, professors at universities and so forth. And they, the same people tend to show up in the social movement and in state organized events. And I think the people in the villages are quite aware of that. And so that says quite a bit about the social movement as well. So thank you, um, Hawaii. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks for that, Scott. I'm really glad that we managed to get you here uh, and cover uh, a very, very different angle. I mean, well, when we think about Taiwanese social movements, we have, we have a, we have a uh, stereotype that uh, it's a very green uh -huh. thing. Um, and and I've, I've had that. Um, I've, I've seen that a lot, but one of the things that came up both in your talk uh -huh. and in a number of the um, um, the papers in, in the conference last week was um, this doesn't this kind of stereotype doesn't really work anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, one of the things that, that struck me, for example, some of my work with the Green Party uh -huh. is uh, how much how much many of these activists really hate the DPP, uh -huh. for example. Uh, I mean, they hate the KMT, but they hate the DPP as uh, as, as well. Um, similarly, if, if we're thinking about um, social movement supporting um, immigrant spouses, mm -hmm. um, they tend to be actually uh, very, very pro KMT. Uh -huh. um, partly, particularly the, those with um, supporting mainland Chinese wives. So there's a lot more diversity when we look at, at Taiwanese social movements. Um, and again, I think your presentation also reflected the, the problems of the periodization. Again, uh -huh. this, this is something that, again, that came up a lot. I mean, originally I thought that 2008 would be the a perfect cut-off point, but I think in a lot of the, the movements we looked at, actually, uh, it didn't really work. There was a lot more continuity. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I found really interesting that came up a lot in our discussions last week, and I think you've touched upon this as well, is uh, the relationship between political parties mm -hmm. and this kind of elite mass um, um, kind of gap, mm -hmm. which uh, I think well, again I think was really interesting in in, in this. Uh, in this case that you looked at, and of course the um, this idea about an Aboriginal political party. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I wasn't actually aware of this, uh, the case in the 1990s, mm -hmm. um, 
And again, this is something again that came up last week when we were looking at the Green Party and whether or not it, it could actually act as a, uh, as a voice for um, some of these social movements and particularly the uh, environmental movement. And even within the environmental movement, there's a lot of doubts about whether it can actually fulfill uh, this role. I mean, for, for you, do, do you see any, uh, do you see it having any, any real prospects, this um, First Nation party? Because I know my students, but I think maybe you've, you've had some correspondence with um, Luancy, uh -huh. who's who, one of her projects is looking at uh, indigenous voting behavior uh -huh. and why they tend, how do you explain this? What this kind of continuation, even though many of the social, Aboriginal social movements are quite anti KMT, uh -huh. but when it comes to voting, um, it's still pretty consistent. Uh -huh. um, I mean, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a number of things there. I mean, would you, what do you think about this, this uh, First Nation party? Uh -huh. Do you see how any prospects? Yeah, I, I think that in terms of prospects, I tend to agree with uh, Emil Durkheim who said that the problem with studying the future is that there's so many data. Okay. But, <laughs> that being said, I think that my, my, I can wish them well and hope that maybe mm -hmm. they can gain one or two seats. Mm -hmm. um, the prospects of that, I think, are quite low because the KMT is so firmly entrenched in there, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the villages. And Kaoji Sumi is very firmly entrenched in her position as well. So I think it's rather difficult to beat the incumbents at the game that they've been playing so well for so long. I, mean, again, yeah. another, I think another fascinating trend that you highlighted was this development of social media, which I think for us, um, the people that are observing Taiwanese um, development, it's, it's an amazing tool. I wonder whether it's better actually more useful for us researchers yeah. than it is actually for um, social movement yeah. activists. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, that's why more research has to be done before we can say anything about it, because as much as I enjoy looking at their websites mm. and their Facebook pages, and even though I friend them and make them like a fan of their pages, I don't know how people really are using social media. Mm. And I have very little evidence to say that ordinary people in the villages are using that. I mean, one of the things that came out in some of my, my Green Party interviews was um, we were trying to, we asked this question about um, what made you vote Green uh, for the Green Party? And a large proportion of the people we interviewed, uh, it was uh, getting information via social media. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be interesting to see, um, once people look at this in some detail, uh, firstly, where is this coming from, where is this activism coming from, but also, um, does it actually lead to any changes mm -hmm. in voting behavior? Right. That's, um, again, I think it's a big unknown. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, anyone who would like to kind of uh, get started. Oh yeah, uh, you and then. Yeah. Well, it seemed to me, although I did it by now, um, there are two major issues from what you're saying. Uh, first is the land, mm -hmm. secondly is the hunting issue. Mm -hmm. And these two, has it changed? I mean, have this uh, issue of concern changed over the years? Mm -hmm. and, and more prominent or less so, or because the big was concerning about voting. Mm -hmm. But your findings seem to suggest that um, livelihood or the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, issues are more prominent for ordinary people. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, um, the change of regime uh -huh. have their concerns changed accordingly? because of the change of regime. No, you don't no, think so. no, I would say that these two issues are the two key issues for indigenous people. And they have had exactly the same problem no matter who was in the president's office. Was well, it was never resolved? It was never resolved because the, the main issue is that there are two types of land that the movements are concerned with. There's the reserve land. Like, which is called Bangladesh, and that was the case with Asia cement, and that was also the case with part of the Taralco National Park, is that the township office is in charge of regulating the reserve land, and what happened in the case of Asia cement is there was actual fraud. 
Whereas they had somebody forged the names of, and used, borrowed the chops for some other purpose and then used them on these documents, saying that they had renounced their rights to land to the township office, which then turned around and leased the land to Asia Cement. So there was fraud there. Um, so there are issues regarding the use of reserve land. And usually it's not fraudulent, but it, even more often there are township authorities who are themselves aboriginal, who have prior knowledge of which land was, is dedicated to be leased to the creation of an industrial park or something. And so they hurry up and register that name, that land in their names. And even though somebody else is farming there but never bothered to register their land, and then when it comes time to transfer the land, they get the money. And so there's been those issues. So reserve land. But then the traditional territories often where issues happen because governments, whether it's DPP or KMT, have never recognized any legitimacy of indigenous claims to traditional territory. They just claim it's boil deep, so it belongs to the forestry division or the, the Ministry of Defense or somebody, and the, the indigenous people have no right to that. So that's what mainly one is about in most of these issues. Hunting, and I forget who it was, but somebody said hunting is the only issue that brings indigenous people out, because it is really the only issue that will get everybody in the village upset and will get everybody to turn out to the demonstration. So hunting is a really hot issue. And that one is one in which change has happened. And basically the, the big changes are that they have permitted indigenous men to register up to two homemade rifles with the local police office. Now the problem is then that they have no way of legally acquiring ammunition or gunpowder. <laughs> And so it's still relatively illegal for them to hunt. One man just this past, just a few weeks ago, told me that he was so angry with all of this that he took his two rifles that he legally registered at the police station and just gave them to him and said, I don't want to have any legally registered rifles, which just identify me as a hunter, and then I still can't hunt anyway as I would like. And so that's been an issue. The, uh, there have been regulations created that permit them to apply in advance for hunting for cultural reasons. And I actually have a document, which is very interesting. They have a list of all of the cultural reasons for hunting according to tribal by community. Because they actually asked the, the, each community to provide a list of what cultural reasons they would have for hunting. And in some of them, they said it's because of a certain festival, which of course excludes people who want to hunt for other reasons. And then uh, Simak Busu was very good at coming up with a list of cultural reasons, saying maybe for marriages and so forth we need to hunt, or to give gifts to our in-laws and all of that. Other communities didn't think about those parts of culture that are just everyday life. So the list can be applied to every tribe? No. Only so if Sumapusa says we hunt because we have to give meat to our in-laws, but then um, somebody else, their tribe, doesn't say that, they have to go according to their list that they made. So you know, this way of legalizing hunting is still constraining hunting at the same time. Um, and probably the biggest issues are that it's completely illegal to hunt in national parks. And many of them have their hunting territories in national parks. And probably most, the most obvious case of all is that trapping is entirely illegal. And nobody seems to be bringing up this issue. You know, it's all about hunting rifles. But most people who hunt are elderly people who are using traps. And nobody seems to be talking about on behalf of these elderly trappers. And they took it arrested. So, so this, this issue has gone throughout the Tensway so and the Mind Job Administration. And nobody seems to care. And in fact, the non indigenous population in Taiwan seems to stigmatize hunting, which they see as backwards or they see it as killing animals and being somehow immoral and so forth. Yeah, thank you for your uh, talk. It's very interesting when you do the comparison between 
the indigenous Taiwanese in Taiwan and the state of the First Nations in Canada. And what's interesting is because just like Taiwan, you have the French in Quebec who want to go on independence, half of them, three referendums, I think, the Parti Québécois and the power of it. And then going back to the 90s, you have the Okra crisis in Quebec as well. And it was a similar circumstance if you compare with Taiwan, the whole land grab issue. Uh -huh. And then you have the Mohawks taking up arms and confronting Canadian forces having this crisis going on. So I was just wondering, if we continue this comparison, to what extent does there exist a capacity within Taiwan, within the indigenous people, to resort to similar measures if, if they keep getting pushed, such as the issue of the nuclear waste uh -huh. being put on their land? Whether, whether if, if they have no other choice, they resort to having armed complications uh -huh. with the central government, I think. Well, obviously they don't have arms. Yeah. Because <laughs> well, I mean, the hunters work that way. Yeah, they've got they got rifles, yeah. but you know they don't have arms that wouldn't the Mohawk are armed. Right. Um, but you know there is like in Toma, they block the roads. So I guess that shows that they can learn from that. And I'm pretty sure that in Toma and Hawaiian, they actually decided to block roads because they know the Canadian First Nations block roads. Um. Uh, have there been any discussions about using uh, referendums uh, for self-determination? Mm -hmm. No at all? No, no. Okay. Which is surprising, yeah. actually. Yeah. It, it seemed to be logical to me that back when the Taroko were having all of these meetings about creating a Taroko autonomous region, that one of the first steps they should take would be to have a referendum among the Taroko people and ask them if they want to have that. And then they can take the results of their own referendum to the government and say, our people want this. Mm -hmm. But the organizers of that said, well, the only thing we really need to do is talk to the Shinsangye. So they wanted to talk to Yoshi Kun, they didn't want to talk to the Taroko people. And I... So do you think that's back down to this kind of elite, yeah. grassroots uh -huh. um, gang? Yeah, it does. And it certainly makes it look as if self-determination or autonomous districts is only an affair of beauty. Mm. They've done a poor job of reaching out to ordinary people. Uh, Yumiko, you have any questions? Sorry, I have a kind of artificial ripping. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the Taiwan Convention. So you talk about the UN uh, Convention, Homer Island Convention. Now in Taiwan, it's all part a uh, state member of the UN. Uh -huh. They bought the Taiwan uh, there is a review about the ICCPR mm -hmm. and the second review. Is any review about uh, check international convention on the elimination of all forms of racial uh, discrimination yeah. review in Taiwan now? If, if someone's been reviewing there. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a, they, they are not part of the UN, right. but they, they follow this schedule and uh, follow this model. Just use this, uh, for example, they use this uh, uh -huh. size count review and ICCPR review, uh -huh. uh, international legal uh, covenants, legal and so on. And uh, is any review about the, about this, uh, for example, for the integrity uh -huh. the rights review, is yeah. according to uh, UN uh, Human Rights Convention? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, Taiwan tries to evaluate itself in accordance with UN instruments like the Human Development Report that creates its own. And the, the issue here is not the Human Rights Convention, but the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRI. And the UN sends its special report around the world to gather information about you know, Canada and so forth. And of course, they don't go to Taiwan. Um, but Taiwan has uh, made its own reports, and I, I think it's quite disappointing to say that Taiwan has a tendency to just say, oh yes, we have already um, achieved 80% of the goals of the declaration. And I think that they're a little bit, I think it's a little bit of government propaganda there. They really have not achieved the goals of UNDRIP, and they have not understood or achieve any of the spirit of it, which is 
assuming that it's the indigenous peoples themselves who have certain rights that the government should respect. Even if you look at the basic law and you look at UNDRIP and you compare them, uh, UNDRIP basically says the indigenous peoples have such and such a right, whereas if you look at the Taiwan basic law, it says the state shall. <laughs> so the subject of the document is very different. Can I ask a question on um, Aboriginal language education? Because um, actually, I think it was in this room um, a few months ago. We've got um, uh, Anita Jung showed her film about uh, protection of uh, indigenous languages uh -huh. in Taiwan and, and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering to what extent have Aboriginal social movements actually stressed uh, preservation of, of local languages? I, I think it was something, one of those movement clips was something about uh, education. Mm -hmm. how, uh, how important is this? Yeah. And, 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 and the other question that, that had been crossing my mind listening to your presentation was. How many Aboriginal um, social movement groups are there? Yeah. There seems to be such a long list. Yeah. And, 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 and I think to myself, um, okay, we're talking about elitist groups. Yeah. The, uh, so these are going to be very, very small. Yeah. And I can imagine, they, uh, they, do they work well together? Or are they very, very conflictual? Yeah, they're very conflictual. I think they're very much unrelated to one another. And there's no question how many, but then you have to define who is a social movement and who is not. Mm -hmm. Because there are also all of these NGOs that are there to promote indigenous language education. Mm -hmm. And I have tended not to think about those as social movements because they tend to be created by teachers as a vehicle for applying for funding to create um, <laughs> textbooks and so forth. And so I've tended to see that it's related to but apart from you know, political activism mm -hmm. of any sort. Um, the disappointing part of it is that indigenous education for language training tends to be one to two hours a week. Mm -hmm. And I've actually gone and sat in on the classes. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be mostly memorizing lists of words. And they don't make it into a living language. They, make, they teach it as if it were a dead language. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I mean, that, I think that came out in, in Anita's uh, uh -huh. film. I think that there was, there was a real contrast between Hawaii uh -huh. and, and Taiwan. I think, I think the overall conclusion, I think, when we watched that film, was quite pessimistic yeah. about the preservation, at least yeah. among younger generation. Yeah. Because uh, I've seen immersion schools in Canada mm -hmm. where the entire curriculum from first grade until the end of sixth grade is entirely in their language, mm -hmm. no matter what they study. And then I see them do one or two hours a week in Taiwan, and it saddens me to see that they're not taking it seriously. Um, and furthermore, I've even seen that those teachers and principals who are promoting these native language education programs, just one or two hours a week, are sending their own children to other schools. Oh, okay. Because they want their, their own children to be more able to compete in, in a bigger society. And so I, I see that, and that's rather uh, distressing as well. Mm. But, and also I've seen um, one person told me that they actually in Shomi, when they had a more proactive cultural and language education, a lot of the parents took their children to school and sent them to Shinza. Uh, so. uh, yeah, Nikki and uh, also Jack as well. Yeah, just to kind of sidestep away from that uh -huh. discussion there and let's go back into the beginning of, of your presentation uh -huh. where you you are you, you showed the, the picture of my angel uh -huh. dressed to impress. <laughs> um, so I was just I was just, you know, one of the questions that you raised within that would be this the kind of the idea that, you know, that these was predominantly a thing. Uh -huh. and, through. and then why is this something that was continuing? And I was just wondering whether or not that you think this could be a case of almost like neutralizing the discourse, mm -hmm. so to speak, where by by doing so you're kind of removing the fact that he's not doing it. Mm -hmm. So there is not an argument towards him saying you're not. This is something that you're not doing. Uh -huh. So he can concentrate on his thing, but providing he's been seen mm -hmm. to kind of being there, whether or not that you think. It could be a case of like just taking away mm -hmm. um, fire from the DPP in the sense it's not really. I don't, I don't think there's an intention of taking away fire from the DPP. I don't think there's that. I think that there's enough of a 
path dependence, even in the KMT, that it has its own dynamic that has nothing to do with the DPP. No, Chiang Kai-shek used to start events with dances and indigenous people. And he was not you know, trying to prove that Taiwan's not part of China. He was saying he was China, but he still did that as, I think, a way of reaching out to local people. And, you know, the legislators are there, and they're mostly KMT. But I think it really has its own internal dynamic, and so I don't think it has anything to do with it. Yeah, Jack. Uh, uh, to me, it's a big surprise that uh, you mentioned that there was a uh, 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 smoking, uh -huh. smoking, uh, hunter smoke. And that happened in the 228 uh -huh. um, memorial of And to me, it is, it's intriguing because uh, to me, 228 sounds like a Taiwanese identity uh -huh. issues. But the indigenous people, they have their own uh, identity issues. Uh -huh. I'm asking because about one year ago, I had a drink indigenous writer, Xiaman uh -huh. and he was a leader in the anti Okay, of And I asked him a big question. What about your identity issue? Do you identify yourself with the Taiwan uh -huh. or do you agree with the Taiwanese activities and issues? Or even do you identify with the previous KMT chimes uh -huh. the other? And he gave me the impression that uh, that is your Taiwanese people's business. Uh -huh. That's not their business. Yeah. So I want, want to ask you how how did you observe the Long Yan Xing Dong at the two to eight memorial mm -hmm. and the How did they see themselves, are they involved in this or do they to some extent identify with the Taiwanese identity? Yeah, I think that's the whole reason why we have to talk about social movements in plural. Mm -hmm. uh, because there really is a great diversity of, of possibilities here. Now obviously, the hunter smoke actually has chosen to identify with Taiwan. And that's why they picked 228 as the day to have their big demonstrations, because they want to say that, you know, we indigenous people have suffered. And they say that, you know, they draw attention to how indigenous people were active in 228. The Zhou tribe was the one that was very active in that. Gao Yisheng led a, led a, you know, an attack on the Changi airport, and he was executed afterwards. And, but obviously from Orchid Island, that's something that's happening on the mainland and has nothing to do with Orchid Island, with the Tao people. I mean, the Taiwanese main. Yeah, thank you for that very uh, interesting talk. And uh, I would like to address on uh, one point about the social media, as you say, like the, um, uh, the indigenous people use the social media for um, different, like addressing different issues or um, different things. Uh, for me, um, there are um, certain uh, functions of social media I noticed. Um, one of them is, uh, the first one is marketing, mm -hmm. branding, which kind of the uh, some group of people who identify themselves as they, the Aboriginal people. And uh, um, the second is, um, it's like an information outlet for, mm -hmm. say, connect, uh, like for people among themselves. As you mentioned, like how the village people actually uh, use the social media, whether they use it in their daily lives or not. Like what how I say is they probably don't use it that often, but when there's a certain uh, big issues or big events, they will use it as a as an information outlet um, to um, connect people among themselves, or uh, it's like a bridge between uh, the locals and international communities. Which uh, uh, I mean, you you, observe, you can observe something similar in in the sunflower movement or in other movements elsewhere in the world. And uh, uh, also, um, there is the third, the third um, part of it, the third characteristic of it, is 
uh, very crucial, uh, in my opinion, is the platform for uh, user-generated content mm -hmm. because it's not just um, the you know the webmaster or the admin posting posting things. So it's, it's not just for the official um, people, you know, um, uh, uh, giving out information, mm -hmm. but also a, a platform for you know people in their community mm -hmm. to 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 post uh, whatever events or or, or other uh, content on it. Um, it's usually triggered by major events, for instance, if you see the sunflower movement, there are actually many students or uh, many uh, ancient so, uh, social activists uh, posting um, like uh, photos, videos, uh, reports in, in the square or elsewhere, you know, what's happening right now. So I'm wondering, uh, so um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, this, uh, the, the use of social media, the presence of social media would um, strengthen uh, the identity of indi indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how significant do you see it in, in, in the in the future? Because apparently, the, the current is still kind of new. It only happened in the past ten years. Yeah. Like say Facebook, not Twitter, <coughs> but like like people of older generation may not use it often. But for the younger generations, they would you know carry on using it. They they already exposed it. So, how significant do you see uh, this contribution to? to the, uh, um, the recognition of the identity of indigenous people. Yeah. people. I think, yeah, Sorry. people, yeah. I think that, like I said, that we really need to do some research on this specifically yeah. to know for sure. Um, I think one of the big changes is that back when Mikhail Rodon was doing his research, he thought that, because people were saying this back then, that they didn't even like the word Yuzumi. And now I think everybody identifies very clearly as being Yuzumi. Um, but then the problem is, you know, social, the social media, how does that contribute? And I can say that from my observations, which are not systematically collecting, is that I've seen very few people using Twitter. But what I have seen is that people love Facebook. And recently, in fact, my invitations to be friends on Facebook coming from Taiwan are coming from elderly people as well, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So people in their 60s and 70s are now using Facebook as well because they have it on their smartphones. So they're not you know, using a computer, it's not an intimidating tool inside, it's, a, it's, it's, their, it's their smartphones. Now, how they're using it is something that actually would take an ethnographer going there and asking questions and following people around, watching how they're using it. My impression, and this is only based on you know, maybe the 200 people that are in indigenous communities who have friended me on Facebook and just seeing what they post. My impression is that they're posting life events, meals, <laughs> <laughs> cute animals, and almost nothing to do with the indigenous social movement. But does that even apply to the, um, the various um, social movement groups? Yeah. I mean, are they, uh, um... Well, the social movement groups tend to have their dedicated page. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. And so it is all about their movement. So if you go to the Hunter Smoke, actually, they've got their Facebook page, which you can follow, mm -hmm. and they have, you know, the social yeah. movement there. How many people are following that, I don't know. Right, okay. Um, so I was just one very yeah. quick uh, comment on, on uh, two things. Uh -huh. um, about Twitter, I know as I, I heard from my Taiwanese friends, it is not really common. It's not very popular yeah. among the Taiwanese. But intriguingly, um, when there's uh, when at the start of sunflower movement, uh -huh. I was uh, slightly involved in it. Uh, my Taiwanese friends was encouraging um, or involve the participants to use Twitter to use hashtag yeah. in uh, um, spreading the information yeah. to the outside world to the international community, so that. So that's why I'm saying this is like a, a platform, an right. information outlet. And like you said about Facebook, like a personal Facebook account is uh, pretty much like you post yeah. like live events, news, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you know, it's through your personal itself. But for the, the indigenous people, that the, for the, for their page, indigenous people's page, um, when there is some major events, then everyone can contribute to the uh -huh. event, uh, to the to the to the uh, official page. Meanwhile, if there's anything put on the official page, everyone's account is serves as a knot of spreading the information. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's just that's my problem. Yeah, uh, we've got three. Uh, oh, yeah, three questions. Theo, uh, Susan, and the back. Yeah, well, let's take let's take these three. Okay. Together, I think. 
Yes, yeah, Theo, you want to go first? Uh, yes, yes. It's about uh, Aboriginal self uh, autonomy. Uh -huh. um, after so many years of uh, campaigning for uh, Aboriginal self government, um, you can see for the end of this year, we start to have uh, Aboriginal chief, uh, Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal district chief being elected. Uh -huh. um, my question is, um, so what kind of uh, major changes have there been before and after? Or is, is it a kind of symbolic thing instead of real changes? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's Susan. Uh, I, I just want to know, do you see that there's any clear co collaboration between tribes uh -huh. uh, participating Social work because I have been looking at historically the existence of Aboriginals, um, but they don't seem to they, they share the same, some in some ways like, like hunting and they, they all have head hunting uh -huh. hunting, but they don't seem to to in the way for them to express their resistance, but they don't seem to work with each other. Uh -huh. But historically, because I mean they don't speak the same languages, uh -huh. they have different identities. And they are often, often um, at, 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 um, in, in a tribal warfare. Mm -hmm. But with the current ones, the social movement to Aboriginals, uh, do you see they they have they, they, they try to intend to work together in order to push a bit more work on their, their identity or their hunting um, and even having guns as well? Yeah. Yeah, because I was suffering from the hay fever, so I have a block dose right now. So um, I have like one question and uh, one comment. Uh, my question is about um, what I mean. If during your uh, research uh, experience, how do you see these indigenous people in the Taroko area? Uh -huh. um, they are using some uh, public resources, such as like the Bulo one. Because I know, like originally, when the telephone national project planned those, um, um, like a, they call it like com community center, as uh -huh. well as the tourist um, demonstration, um, um, like retreat. They want to, they want indigenous people to use it as a, a community center, as well as they want the tourists to come over and then maybe like um, buy something uh -huh. from indigenous people and then in, use in the it. park. Yeah, in the part that like in those kind of um, like a uh, uh, um, uh, not not purely tourist, uh -huh. but also like uh, it's also for the local as well. However, because of that kind of the inner uh, dynamic between different indigenous peoples in Taroko, uh -huh. I, w I was wondering like how those different groups of people are using these uh, pre-exist facility. Or they were just majorly controlled and managed by the people, the outsiders who got the bits. That's okay. my question. And my feedback about the social media is because um, I'm from the um, UCI anthropology, uh -huh. so we do do some research about the social media. And one of our professors um, article about the fall of Facebook actually uh, made the uh, the stock price of Facebook um, drop by 3.8 percent after he, that art blog article was. Um, Revealed by a newspaper journalist, and according to our research, um, usually the Facebook post that is under 50 words uh -huh. will have better response. And for most of the fa uh, Facebook posts, if that exists 200 words, usually you will get people feel bored and they don't really, I mean, bother to read it. So what happened is most people will uh, give like fragmental. Um, I mean the, I mean the, um, the experience of Facebook page uh, manager or editors, they will use like a photo with like less than 150 words to describe a fragmental incident and then a message. So the truth is people will receive fragmental message instead of the whole picture uh -huh. by Facebook. The other um, uh, finding is that more elder people are using Facebook right now. Actually, the, the young user of Facebook is, is dramatically dropped. One reason is your, your parents is using Facebook. <laughs> 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 it's, it's not cool anymore. Yeah, it's not cool anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but the second thing is like, um, um, because like um, Twitter and Instagram can share like more instant and uh, um, condensed information that young people are more um, 
um, easier to absorb. Uh -huh. uh, uh, but for Taiwanese people, um, although like there's a large amount of elderly, like, over 50 population, a uh, 50 years old population are using Facebook, they are mainstream right now. However, um, the, a lot of people, I mean, uh, in Taiwan, they're still using a um, platform called PTT. That is like the BBS platform, uh -huh. although that is old, but it somehow is served as uh, similar like Twitter. It's text-based, instant, and like have a lot of um, interact um, um, function with it. So that might be a possible reason why, like, um, what you observe in Taiwan and how why your Taiwanese friend responds to your cute animals rather than the minimal articles you post. Thank you. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, let's take one final point. Question. <laughs> uh, um, my name is Bill and uh, I'm, uh, according to the Hunt and Smoke, uh, mm -hmm. I'm one of the uh, activists in 2008 mm -hmm. in Masha. And what do you think about, uh, uh, when you're looking at the Hunt and Smoke, do you think that it's very useful to demonstrate to our government? Because in, in two nineteen to, uh, 2009, uh -huh. yes, Miracle Typo, and uh, our government always forces to abandon our community to mm -hmm. live in such a community. And uh, I don't believe our government extremely well. So uh, uh, we are going to have more and more demonstrations to, our, to protect our government because indigenous community is very complicated mm -hmm. because our leeway is most of the indigenous leeway is KMT, mm -hmm. and the people live in the village. Mm -hmm. We are uh, 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 we put a lot of ex efforts mm -hmm. to to pre uh, to preserve our right. Mm -hmm. And Xin Zhenyuan, uh, I also don't believe that. So, uh, what do you think that uh, this kind of demonstration is is very useful in? How can we improve mm -hmm. to our government, to protect our government in the future of the time? Okay, so you have quite a lot of stuff. Yeah, definitely a lot. And I. Uh, Maybe you should just be a little bit selective, and then perhaps we no. can we can also continue some of this discussion over a um, uh, a drink, if uh, yeah. if you still have the energy. Yeah, I do. But I think we can do all four of those rather yeah. quickly. So I've got to test my memory here. <laughs> so the first one is about autonomy. autonomy and what changes have come about. And that's really a, actually an easy one. People have been talking about indigenous autonomy in Taiwan ever since 1945. Gao Yisung was actually the first one to say, we should have an indigenous autonomous district in Taiwan. His image, this is because he was at the end, he was a you know, leader of the Japanese period, and his idea was that they would all come together and have one autonomous district. That never happened. Um, now what's happening is they're encouraging local chiefs to be elected who have no real political power at all. But all the way through this, no indigenous autonomous region has ever been created yet. And so there are debates about that. KMT has said that we can create autonomous regions as long as we don't interfere with pre-existing administrative boundaries, as long as the non-indigenous people have the same rights as before. And they've got their very modest proposal. Um, and then I think that most of the indigenous activists hope that each nation will have its own autonomous district. And so nothing's happened so far. Um, probably the most realistic one would be for each village to have its own, each alang in Seje to have its own, because those are people who already identify with one another, because that gets to your question about whether the movement has moved beyond the big identities. And they're trying really hard, and I think that the church has tried to do that, the URM movement, and um, all of these movements like the Hunter Smoke are attempting to create a new pan-indigenous identity. But there are still frictions there. You know, when I was in the Dekadaya village of Pelupa, I was sitting and drinking beer with some people, and then 
Wadajiro, one of the big activists of the Sejik, you know, name rectification, came looking for me. And they said to me, you can't leave with him. He's Doda. <laughs> During the Japanese period, they killed our people. Oh. Yeah. And that was in the film, Sajik Pilpala, right? And that's within the group that calls themselves Sejek. There are three different ones. Not to mention the hostilities that still exist between the, 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 the Drogo and the Amis and the Bonon and so forth. But there are really deep-seated hostilities that still exist. So they're still there, but they're trying as hard as they can to deal with it. Your question, I'll answer that really quickly about the Taroko National Park. They have a visitor center and never a good one. And it's just basically the park administration controls that completely. It has nothing to do with the local people. The local people are very upset that they're not allowed to go and set up, uh, you know, sell sausages or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's still a bone of contention there. The big issue now is they want the, the people who live in the park want the, uh, uh, what's it called? The build one. Let's say that. The, the little like, the cable car uh, has broken down. And so now they want a road that goes up to their village. So that's their big issue. And your question is very good. I think it's really important. And I hope that you can take it back to Taiwan. <laughs> but I think that demonstrations are important. They're an important part of mobilization. Um, but in the village, and I'm sure you know this from your own village, a lot of people are confused about it. Um, in fact, when I was going around asking people, <laughs> they would, uh, do you know what, uh, what one very common response was, <laughs> so they didn't even know what it meant. So I had to explain to them, and they tend to equate it with gaojing sume, um, oh. demonstrating and making people angry, and they really don't like that. Mm. So I don't think that the use of demonstrations in Taipei or wherever is going to be helpful within the community itself. But it's important for branding, it's important for media attention, and I think that the success of the indigenous social movements everywhere depends on reaching out to non-indigenous people. And I would encourage you actually to take a look on the internet at I don't know more. I-D-L-E-N-O-M-O-R-E dot C-A. I bet you can Google it because it's been very successful in Canada at getting non-indigenous people to support the indigenous rights movement. And it's really gaining traction and it might influence the next elections. And that might be a model for Taiwan moving forward. So idle no more. That's CA. Okay. On that point, I think we should um, uh, we should finish <laughs> continue our discussions over some beer or wine. Uh, so let's give uh, Scott one more. So as. Uh, So if any of you still have some energy, I think we'll, we'll relocate to the Institute of Education part. Maybe it's a good location. <laughs>